On October 19, 2017, astronomers first saw an object from outside of our own solar system. Uh, it was traveling through. But I guess it wasn't really traveling through. Our solar system was moving in a swirl around our, our huge galaxy, and we were traveling through. And uh, there was a large object found. We think it was a comet. We think it was an asteroid. Our guest speaker is going to elaborate on that a little bit. But this large object is known as Oumuamua. And our guest speaker today, Dr. Kevin Healy, Director of Astronomy, Mesa Community College. He's going to talk about that. And uh, Kevin has, uh, has, has a long time with the Mesa Community College. College. He's a great professor over there. Uh, he's a great person. And just talking, he's a very friendly guy. And so, folks, please welcome Dr. Kevin Healy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about this uh, interstellar object, Oumuamua. Uh, the name comes from Hawaiian. I'll explain uh, where the name comes from here in a little bit. Um, just a brief outline of the things I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'll talk about how it was discovered, where it was discovered, uh, some of its observed properties. That's going to be uh, a large bulk of the talk, talking about how we know and what we know about this object. Uh, talk about the natural explanation that most astronomers would give to uh, describe where this object came from, why it was passing through the solar system. Um, that will probably take us up to the break, and then after the break, I'd like to expand on some of the mysteries that we have about this object. Uh, we only observed it with telescopes for a very brief period of time throughout uh, 2017 and part of 2018, um, and that was it, because it left the inner solar system, it left the neighborhood of the Earth, and we just can't observe it anymore. Um, and then I'll draw some conclusions and talk about the next object which is already here. So Oumuamua, what we call Oumuamua now, uh, started out as a speck of light discovered by the Pan-STARRS telescope, uh, which is on the summit of Haleakala on the island of Maui in Hawaii. Uh, there's a major observatory there. Uh, the Air Force runs a telescope there. The University of Hawaii runs telescopes on the summit. Uh, the uh, astronomer who was credited with discovering the object in the observations by the telescope is Robert Warrick. He was a local astronomer from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, at the time, the expectation was that this object was far off in the solar system. Um, it was likely a comet. And so it was given the designation C 2017 U1, and this is a typical sort of serial number that is given to astronomical objects that are thought to be in the solar system um, somewhere, and that can be pinned down as the, uh, as the data rolls in. So this code number simply means C, it was thought to be a comet, 2017 was the year of discovery, uh, each two-week period during the year is, is labeled with a, a capital letter. Um, so for the uh, second half of October, the letter U was used. And during that two-week period, this was the first object that was discovered. So we have C2017 U1. Uh, the telescope itself is known as PAN-STARRS. Uh, it's much easier to say than the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. 
Uh, so everyone calls it PanStars. You may have seen this name in the news before. It's a very prolific discoverer of comets and asteroids. Some of those comets grow bright enough that they can be seen by small telescope, um, by amateur astronomers. Others are are uh, interesting only to research astronomers. Uh, it's a 1.8 meter diameter mirror, so the telescope is, is about six feet across. Uh, that is the diameter of the mirror of the telescope. It's operated by the University of Hawaii. And uh, it, at the time, uh, until its successor comes along, it has the currently largest camera in existence. Uh, 1.4 billion pixels. That's an image that's about 30,000 pixels by 30,000 pixels. Um, the advantage there is that this telescope can take a very large picture of the sky all at once. The primary goal of this telescope is to do just what it's been doing, search for objects in our solar system, um, in particular near-Earth asteroids, those asteroids that may be an impact hazard to our planet. We know very well here in Arizona that large objects from space hit the ground. We have Meteor Crater up in the north. Um, we have uh, a growing body of evidence that the age of the dinosaurs ended with an impact of an object about the size of Maricopa County. Um, or excuse me, about the size of Metro Phoenix into the Yucatan Peninsula. We know impacts happen. We know they cause bad days. So uh, if we can find those objects before they run into our planet, uh, that would be a good thing. Part of that effort is this, uh, is this telescope. So the camera on the PanStars telescope uh, takes a picture of um, a few degrees across each, um, each frame, and together over the course of a night, it can photograph about 1,000 square degrees, which is the equivalent of about 4,000 full moons on the sky each night. And this telescope is, is uh, very successful. Uh, it's now responsible for finding about 50% of all new asteroids and comets that are discovered over the... Um, over about the last decade. So here is not the discovery image, but an image that was taken about uh, 10 days after discovery. Uh, the image on the left, um, the small dot. So that is the best image that we have of this object. Uh, it is a dot. Uh, it has no extended uh, atmosphere, no extended uh, cloud of gas around it, as we would expect for a comet. Uh, a typical comet, it's, it, uh, when it's first seen, may have a fuzzy appearance. That fuzzy appearance is due to an extended cloud of gas of perhaps a few thousand kilometers across. Um, our object, C2017 U1, didn't have that. So it was pretty quickly realized that we needed to um, change our label for this object. It was changed to A uh, to reflect that it looked like an asteroid rather than a comet. So by the end of October 2017, uh, the object had already passed by the sun and was on its way out of the inner solar system. Uh, tracking the object through space allowed them to calculate an orbit for this body, and they realized that it actually passed by the sun uh, a few weeks earlier, in early September of 2017. It was already outbound, uh, so we'd missed the entire path of the object as it was coming into, um, into the solar system. Um, it was a very close passage to the sun. The object actually passed inside the orbit of Mercury on its way uh, around the sun, and it was moving very fast. One of the fastest objects that we've ever seen, uh, 88 kilometers per second. To put that in context, our Earth orbits the sun at 30 kilometers per second. Uh, 
And Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, orbits at 48 kilometers per second. So this object was orbiting almost three, or moving past the sun almost three times faster than Earth orbits the sun. It had fallen in from a great distance and picked up speed along the way. So the, the big conclusion from those early days in October 2017 uh, was that this was clearly an interstellar object. It had fallen in from interstellar space, the space between the stars, and fallen toward the sun, missed it by just a little bit, swung around, and went back out into the far reaches of the solar system. Today, two years later, it is now roughly at the distance of Saturn and will continue to drift away from the sun for the, the coming decades and centuries. And in about a thousand years, it will have left the vicinity of the sun entirely. This was the first of its kind, an object from interstellar space that had entered the solar system. And so a new label, not C for comet or A for asteroid, but I for interstellar was, uh, was invented. And uh, this object was then given the name 1I for the very first astronomical interstellar object um, and given the name Oumuamua. The name was chosen from native Hawaiian to rec uh, recognize the fact that this telescope existed uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and the name translates roughly as first scout or first messenger. And again, to recognize the, the uh, status of this unique object. So uh, to the orbit. Uh, by tracking the object, we could tell how fast it was moving. We could project that motion backward in time to tell how fast it was moving as it rounded the sun. We could tell how fast it was moving as it moved away from the sun. And so as an object moves away from the sun, the sun's gravity wants to pull it back, just as if we throw something into the air, Earth's gravity will want to pull it back. And as, it ob as an object moves away, the gravitational attraction weakens. And so there's a competition between at any distance how fast it's moving and how strong the gravitational pull is. If it's moving fast enough, then that outward motion never stops. Just as if we could go outside and throw something up very, very fast, it just wouldn't come back down. And that's the principle of space flight. Here we have a natural object passing through the solar system so fast that it's not bound to the sun. The sun's gravity will not keep it in orbit. And so by November of 2017, there were a number of papers that were published that were reporting that this object was clearly interstellar in origin. So, just a little bit about orbits. We have orbits of different sizes. Uh, we have a circle in red here. We have ellipses of various shapes, and we can describe their shapes mathematically. The green curve is a parabola, a special shape. And then the blue and purple curves here are various hyperbolas. The simplest mathematical description for these shapes is a number called the eccentricity. It's just a number that starts at zero and goes up from there. A circle, a perfect circle, has an eccentricity of zero. An ellipse has an eccentricity that's larger than zero but less than one, so a decimal like 0.2 or 0.8. A parabola has an, an eccentricity of exactly one. And a hyperbola, any of those open curves, has an eccentricity greater than one. Turned out after a good orbit was calculated for the motion of this object around the sun, the eccentricity turned out to be just about 1.2, which was a record at the time. No object passing by the sun had ever had an eccentricity larger than that.
So we can have orbits that are closed, such as Earth's orbit. It repeats around the sun for roughly four and a half billion years, four and a half billion times. All of the other planets, asteroids, comets, um, the moons orbiting around the planets, all of these objects have closed orbits. They are typically ellipses. For Earth, the eccentricity is very small. We usually describe Earth's orbit as a circle, but it's not quite. We're closer to the sun in January and just a little bit further away in July. Conversely, we can have open orbits, like the parabolas and hyperbolas, where the object just goes by once, and that's the end of the story. So, Oumuamua was the first example of an object that had such a high eccentricity, we could clearly state that this object wasn't from around here. It had come from somewhere else, and it was going somewhere else. It wasn't a permanent resident of the solar system. So, here's a diagram showing the path of Oumuamua. Uh, we have the Sun in the center, the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars very close to the Sun, Jupiter further out, Saturn further out, Uranus, and then Neptune. And then for simplicity's sake, we now leave out Pluto. Pluto's orbit is, is tilted, and so it kind of confuses the eye, understand. <laughs> It kind of confuses the diagram, however, so we're, we're leaving it out here. And instead, we show the typical orbit of a comet that is bound to the sun. It's not going anywhere except around and around and around. And a typical comet has an orbit that is tilted relative to the orbits of the other planets. In the case of Oumuamua, it comes in essentially from the North Pole of the solar system, dives around the sun and heads back out. And by um, November, excuse me, by 2018 um, and today, uh, Oumuamua is now out about here. So we can project that path backwards to see where the object came from. It came from the direction very near where Vega, the bright star Vega, is in the night sky. Um, these calculations are very precise. We have many hundreds of measurements of the position of Oumuamua as it moved through the solar system. So our location, our projected location for where it came from uh, is very precise, and astronomers could actually um, locate that on the sky with, uh, with great precision. Also, we can project the speed of that motion backwards in time until we get to a point where the object is outside the solar system, and we can calculate that the, um, that the object was moving 26 kilometers per second relative to the sun even when it was far away, and it had sped up the whole way in being pulled faster and faster and faster uh, by the sun's gravity. So by the time it reached uh, its closest point to the sun, it was moving at 88 kilometers per second. And again, for comparison, Earth orbits the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. So even in interstellar space, this object was moving pretty fast. Now, it turns out it's really not surprising that we would find an object coming from that direction because that's actually the direction that the sun and the rest of the solar system is moving through the galaxy, through the Milky Way. So, while it looked to us as if Oumuamua was coming at us at this high speed, most of that motion was actually due to the sun and the solar system approaching Oumuamua, that most of the speed that we attribute to Oumuamua is actually our speed, and Oumuamua is basically just sitting there waiting for us to run it over. And so Oumuamua, relative to uh, the, the surrounding nearby stars, was essentially sitting still, 
and the solar system ran it over. It hit it. And that caused Oumuamua to pass so close to the sun and, um, and be deflected by this large amount of, of angle. Now, of course, on the broader scale, our sun and our neighboring stars are just a little portion of our Milky Way galaxy. The history of our understanding of where we are in the Milky Way and how large it is is an entire lecture all by itself. We now understand that the Milky Way is a flattened disk of stars, a spiral galaxy, and that disk is approximately 100,000 light years across. So when we talk about the distance to the nearby stars, we're talking about 5, 10, 50 light years. We're talking about a region that's much smaller than this yellow dot. The entire solar neighborhood, the stars that we can look up at the night sky and see, are contained in a region about that big. So our galaxy is a really, really big place. We and the nearby stars are orbiting around the center of the galaxy, about halfway out from the center, and we are moving at a speed of about 220 kilometers per second. So pretty fast. You can't feel it sitting in your chair, but you're actually racing along many times faster than the speed of sound. In fact, many times faster than our planet is even orbiting around our sun. But if we zoom in on that little neighborhood, we can measure the motions of the nearby stars and we see that they're all just kind of wandering around. That's as if you looked out the windows of your car, your windshield, your side windows, your rear windshield, and you saw the cars going every which way on the highway. It would be dangerous for cars. It's what's happening for the stars. There's so much space in between the stars that they can wander around every which way. But in general, they're all following this pattern of moving around. Some are moving faster, some are being left behind, some are moving outward, some are moving upward, some are moving downward in an every which way. We can take all of those motions that we can measure for stars out to some limiting distance, perhaps 100 light years, and we can average, we can find the average um, speed that we would say that neighborhood is moving around the center of the galaxy. And astronomers define that motion, that velocity, as the local standard of rest. Everything in the solar neighborhood is moving relative to that standard. With that in mind, the sun moves at about 17 kilometers per second. So even the sun is moving relative to all of the other stars. When we project the motion of Oumuamua back into interstellar space, we find that Oumuamua was moving at about nine kilometers per second, much slower, half the speed of the sun, relative to the local standard of rest. Other nearby stars are actually moving faster. The sun is kind of average in that respect. So if we were to go and try and pin down which star this interstellar object came from, we would say it couldn't have come from any of them because it's not coming from, it's not moving with the same speed as any of the stars in our neighborhood. So the natural question is, where did it come from? Even though Oumuamua and other objects in the neighborhood are moving at these colossal speeds, those speeds are still very slow compared to the distances between the stars. So if we talk about that bright star in the summer sky, you can go out tonight, look pretty much straight up at about 9 p.m. You'll see Vega high overhead. The light that hits you in the face when you go outside and look at Vega takes 26 years to get here at the speed of light 
light takes 26 years to travel that distance. To an astronomer, we describe that as a distance of 26 light years, the distance that light takes, the, the light travels in 26 years. Oumuamua and the other stars are moving very slowly compared to the speed of light. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So even a speed of 200 kilometers per second is less than one one thousandth the speed of light. So at the speed that Oumuamua is moving relative to the nearby stars, it would take about 100,000 years for Oumuamua to go from Vega, if Vega were its parent uh, solar system, all the way to our solar system. So these interstellar crossings are very, very slow, given the natural speeds of objects in our solar neighborhood. So if we have a journey of 100,000 years, that amount of time is sufficient that the stars themselves are going to wander around. And so while we see today Vega right next to the direction that Oumuamua came from, 100,000 years ago, Vega wasn't there. It was somewhere else in space. And so we have a complication here where we can't just say, oh, well, it came from Vega because Vega's right there. Well, back then, Vega wasn't there. But over the years, astronomers have launched more and more powerful telescopes to measure the motions of the stars. And the crowning achievement right now is a mission by the European Space Agency known as Gaia, named after the, the ancient uh, goddess of the Earth. Uh, Gaia's goal is to measure the, the distance and the proper motions through space of two billion stars. Now, our Milky Way is estimated to contain about 100 billion. So this is a significant fraction of all of the stars in our Milky Way. It's going to take a few years to gather all of this data. Uh, but at the end, it's going to be a fabulous resource for astronomical research. Even so, it started collecting data a few years ago, and so it already has a partial sample of distances and motions in space, what astronomers call proper motions, um, for about seven million stars. And so a team led by Corin Baylor-Jones uh, last year reported on their analysis, trying to identify, okay, where were the stars back in time, and which stars might have been close to Oumuamua's path in the ancient past. They identified four stars that were close, closest, to Oumuamua's past, uh, path in the last several million years. But what they found was that none of the stars got any closer than a light year to the actual trajectory of Oumuamua through interstellar space. So while they were closest, they weren't really close in the sense that you could say, aha, it came right out of that star system or out of that star system. None of the stars, as, as I talked about a few slides ago, share the motion of Oumuamua through interstellar space. So if it was launched, it was either launched at a great velocity from essentially zero to 26 kilometers per second uh, as it left its solar system, but even then it didn't come directly from the neighborhood of the star. It appears to have been coming from uh, some distance away from the star. And so that raises questions as if any of these four um, are actually the parent system for this object. Further complicating things, none of these four stars have known planetary systems. And as I'll talk about here, we think objects like these would come from a planetary system orbiting another star. Now, 
Other caveats, the Gaia data is still preliminary. There's still three more years to the primary mission, so more measurements will be made. Some of the measurements that were, went into this analysis might be corrected by additional data, so we can't hang our hat and say the job is done based on this analysis. The other thing that we know is that Gaia is a relatively small telescope, even if it's very precise, and so it doesn't see any of the fainter stars. And so if there are faint stars, stars that are, that are much less luminous than the sun out there in the Milky Way, we know there are many of them, uh, Gaia can't measure those. And so there may be stars that had a perfectly reasonable motion in the ancient past, going back a few million years, and they line up perfectly. But from the Gaia data, we wouldn't be able to see that. So, if nothing nearby is the solution, maybe Oumuamua just traveled for much longer. Uh, one group uh, suggested that a nearby region of newborn stars, known as Carina Columba, which appears in the southern sky, um, Maybe it's the birthplace. It both matches the motion and the time scale for when a Muamua was over in that part of the galaxy. So maybe it came from there. Or maybe it's just been traveling for billions of years and we will have no idea where it came from. Maybe it just has been orbiting the Milky Way 10, 20, 30 times over the history uh, of its journey and the origin of this object has just been lost. We would have no way of recording it. It would be like trying to figure out where the car next, in the lane next to you on your drive here was 10 years ago. Unless you, you know, work for the DMV and can look up their license plate, uh, you wouldn't know where that car was. And unfortunately, stars don't have license plates, so we can't look them up that way. Okay, so shifting gears a bit. The other surprising thing about this object was it varied in brightness dramatically with a period of about four hours. Now, the numbers here, the magnitude system um, is an is a artifact of observational astronomy. Um, the brighter an object is, the smaller its magnitude is. And so the object appeared bright at about magnitude 22, uh, but then over the course of about an hour, it faded away um, to magnitude 25, and then brightened again, and then faded, and brightened and faded over and over. Each of these are measurements made by a different telescope, so the Very Large Telescope, a very unimaginative name for a telescope, um, <laughs> is down in Chile. It's operated by the European Southern Observatory, uh, the Gemini Telescope, the Keck Telescope, the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, and the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope are all on Mauna Kea Observatory, the big observatory in the big island of Hawaii. They all recorded the same behavior, and these are offset by, by date, um, and you can see that the pattern repeats over and over and over. This dramatic change in brightness is telling us something. If the object is perfectly round, it wouldn't matter what face it was pointing at us, we would see the same amount of sunlight bounce off of it, and the object would appear the same brightness. We would just get a constant brightness. If it were elongated, when we see it rotating its long face at us, then there is a large surface area that's going to reflect sunlight to us, and it's going to appear bright. But if it's sort of the shape of a hot dog here, uh, if we see it end on, then we only see a small surface area, only a small amount of sunlight is going to be reflected to us, and it's going to appear faint. And so this kind of shape, a hot dog shape, appears to describe the shape of a muamua. Here's an artist's representation that's made the news um, all over the world. 
Um, again, it is only an artist representation. It's kind of asteroid, kind of rocky in appearance, uh, but you know, that slide, I, the picture I showed early in the presentation is the best image we have. It's a dot. We have no other information about its shape. Um, we do have some information about its color. It appears redder um, than uh, any other color. And so this dramatic change in brightness indicates that the object is five to ten times longer in one dimension than it is in the other two. So again, it's sort of the dimension of a hot dog. All other asteroids and comets that we've seen up close with spacecraft, um, their maximum ratios are only a ratio of three to one. So this is an extremely, an unusually elongated object, if this is the correct interpretation for this data. So here's a little animation. I just pulled this from the Wikipedia page. Um, there's a number of really talented artists that illustrate various physical features. Um, and so here we see the body tumbling and then the projected brightness that would occur as the object shows us different amounts of surface area. Since we can estimate its shape, we can also describe how it would rotate according to the laws of physics. And the conclusion by uh, the team led by Wesley Frazier, this was published last year, is that the object actually tumbles. It's actually rotating around all three axes simultaneously. And you see that illustrated here. Because it's tumbling, it's hard to pin down exactly how fast it's rotating. It's rotating th in three different ways. But the conclusions, the, the consensus is that um, the, this object rotates in about six to eight hours. So not fast, but not slow. And get used to this. OK, the next feature that was measured uh, was discovered or the, the analysis was made uh, in July of 2018. So after a few months of tracking this object, um, Marco McKelly and his colleagues reported that not only was the object slowing down as expected as it moved away from the sun, but it wasn't slowing down as fast as it should if, Earth, if the sun's gravity were pulling back on it. So it was actually accelerating relative to the rate at which it should be falling away from the sun. So again, this is on the outbound part of its path. Um, we didn't know it was coming into the solar system before it. So here's a little animation that just shows the motion of the planets and then the motion of a muamua heading through and by July of last year, the expected trajectory, just based on the laws of gravity and the observed trajectory of the object, were separated by roughly the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So this was deviating significantly from what could be explained just from the Sun's gravity. This, this difference was small, but it could very precisely be measured. And it turned out that the acceleration, whatever it was caused by, was equivalent to about one one thousandth of the acceleration due to the sun's gravity. So that was amazing all by itself, that this object was, was pushing itself um, as it moved outward from the sun. And initially, this was not unexpected. We see comets do this all the time, comets in our own solar system. Uh, comets are a mixture of essentially dirt and ice. As the comet gets close to the sun, the ice turns into gas, and the gas blasts away from the comet nucleus, the solid center of the comet. Um, and so it acts like jet engines or a rocket engine. Here's an example from 
uh, Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko from just a few years ago. The European Rosetta mission visited this comet and orbited it for a few years. Um, Rosetta photographed these beautiful jets of dust and gas um, blasting away from spots on the surface where ice was exposed to sunlight and that ice heated up and blew off of the surface. So we know this happens for comets, except there's a problem. This doesn't look like a comet. It shows no cloud of gas around it, no escaping gas. So it looks like an asteroid, but it acts like a comet. And many telescopes were brought in. Smaller telescopes were used, no cloud of gas was found. Larger telescopes were brought in, no cloud of gas was found. The Hubble Space Telescope, the telescope that has the sharpest vision that we have, was used. This is not a Hubble picture. This is just a magnified part of that slide, uh, the photograph from the earlier slide. But it's all the same view. It's a point. We see no cloud of gas, no escaping gas from this object. So the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared telescope, was utilized. Spitzer was pointed at Oumuamua for 30 hours, more than a day, to collect the feeble amount of light that was potentially uh, emitted or reflected uh, from this cloud of gas. And in that 30 hours, Oumuamua itself, nor any gas or dust, was detected by Spitzer. That by itself is interesting. But it also rules out a significant amount of gas escaping from this object. So one possible explanation is that the gas was water, that water ice was being converted into water vapor, and that water vapor was escaping away from Oumuamua. The only problem is that Spitzer was sensitive to carbon, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide, and dust, but not water. But water should still reflect sunlight, just as we see clouds in our sky reflecting sunlight. And so the visible pictures that we have of Oumuamua rule out a large amount of water vapor. Spitzer rules out any other sort of gas, or even dust. So if it were pure water vapor, this would be unlike any object that we have in our solar system. Comets and asteroids tend to, if they have water in them, they also tend to have other compounds. So that lack of detection by Spitzer of even Oumuamua's surface puts a strong limit on how large this object can be. This is related to another feature in astronomy called albedo. A low albedo object is an object that has a dark surface and it will strongly absorb sunlight, like a black t-shirt. A high albedo object has a bright surface, like a white t-shirt. It reflects away sunlight and so a white t-shirt will be cooler than a black t-shirt. A dark surface will absorb more sunlight. That means it will get hotter. And so it will also radiate, it will give off, it will emit infrared light. And yet Spitzer did not see Oumuamua at all. Which means that Oumuamua must be very small to escape detection. Under 100 meters, so roughly the size of this building. A high albedo surface would reflect away most of the sunlight, it would stay cool, and it would not emit much infrared. That would be consistent with Spitzer, but it's inconsistent with what we know about how comets behave. The ices and other chemicals in comets get dark. They sort of turn um, the color of tar or motor oil um, as they're exposed to the radiation of space. Well, here we're coming to the conclusion that the surface should be bright. 
So again, uh, things aren't fitting together the way we would expect if this is a natural object, like an asteroid or a comet. So, the natural explanation, the one that is most described in the astronomical research literature, is that, okay, granted, a muamua is an unusual object, but it's roughly the same size, it's a little bit strange in shape, but not extremely so. It could be like the asteroids and comets that we see in our own solar system. But that raises a big question. Why would we expect asteroids and comets to be out there in interstellar space when the asteroids and comets that we see are orbiting the sun? It all comes down to our understanding of how we got here, the family of planets that orbit the sun. The story of, of planet formation tied to the story of star formation involves lots of collisions and the force of gravity. Stars are born with disks of gas and dust orbiting around them, similar to the shape of Saturn's rings, but substantially larger. Gravity pulls that material together to form larger bodies. Those larger bodies collide to form even larger bodies and larger bodies until eventually the planets begin to act like vacuum cleaners and they suck up all the surrounding material and then you have what we have today, a planetary system with large planets separated by large distances and maybe some leftovers. And so this process of planet formation is expected to be messy, to leave lots of debris left over. Those leftovers are what we see as the small bodies, the asteroids and the comets that we see in our own solar system. So the inner solar system contains many millions of asteroids. Asteroids tend to have a rocky composition, but we also are beginning to recognize that many asteroids also have some amount of ice, some percentage of ice, perhaps as much as 50% ice. Uh, the small blue dots are the asteroids that we know of. The, um, the colored orbits are of a few example asteroids. Uh, the green one is the formerly giant asteroid Ceres, now dubbed one of the dwarf planets. You can see that they huddle close to the orbit of Mars and inside the orbit of Jupiter. And there's also a small population of asteroids that lead and trail Jupiter. This is the leftover building blocks that were never pulled together to form an astro uh, excuse me, form a planet. Farther out in the solar system, beyond the orbit of Neptune, we have also an enormous collection estimated to be in the thousands. These objects are part of what's now known as the Kuiper Belt, Kuiper rhyming with Viper. Gerard Kuiper was uh, an astronomer um, doing most of his work in the 1950s who proposed uh, a, a structure in the outer solar system like this. These small icy worlds out there beyond Neptune are the leftovers from the formation from the birth of the outer planets Uranus and Neptune. Pluto sits right at the edge of the Kuiper belt and this relationship is part of the reason that Pluto was effectively demoted to being a dwarf planet. It's a small world and it's one of many icy worlds out there beyond Neptune. Just a, just a quick question since I have you all here. Does anyone have an idea of how big Pluto is? It's one of my favorite questions because it's one of those things that most people don't know. Yes, sir. Okay, so if we were to compare that to Earth or the moon, where would, where would Pluto fit? Okay, size of the moon, anyone else? 
it's, it's bigger than 50 miles. It's about two-thirds of the size of our moon. So as planets go, dwarf is a pretty reasonable ex uh, description of it. it. It is round like a planet, but it's not really that big. It's smaller than Mercury. It's smaller than Mars. It's even smaller than our moon. And yet, as we saw with the New Horizons mission, um, it has active geology, it has an atmosphere, it's round, it has one large moon and four small moons. Uh, it's really a fascinating world. So, to my mind, I don't really care whether it's a planet or not. It's interesting. Um, you know, planet's just a label. We could call Pluto a banana. It wouldn't really be a very good label. And it wouldn't take away what Pluto is or why we should study it. Okay, the last major component of small bodies in our solar system is the Oort cloud. And this is the largest structure. Now the orbits of the planets are completely lost in the scale of this diagram. The Oort cloud is thought to extend out to about a light year. And we estimate that by seeing comets that fall in to the inner solar system and estimate where they must have come from. The Oort cloud are the most extreme. These are objects that were thrown outward by gravitational slingshots by the giant planets. So instead of a body falling into Jupiter and becoming part of Jupiter during its formation, that object missed and was slung past Jupiter, just as a Muamua was slung past the sun. That object then fell outward to some great distance and is now spending most of its time far from the sun, but over its vast lifespan, over many billions of years, it will fall inward towards the sun over and over. And so these are the Oort, cl Oort cloud comets. The Oort cloud, though, is only made up of those objects that were flung outward slowly enough that the sun's gravity could pull them back. But we expect from models of the formation of planets that some very large number of icy and rocky bodies were flung out by Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune at speeds that made them leave the solar system. And so this is, this is the heart of the idea of an astronomical explanation for Oumuamua. That Oumuamua represents a lost body from an asteroid or comet from another solar system. So to summarize, the consensus among astronomers right now is that a Muamua is either an asteroid or perhaps a comet that's lost most of its gas. That object was ejected violently uh, from its parent solar system, from its home solar system, sometime in the past. Perhaps millions, maybe billions of years in the past. That object has been traveling through space for all of that time, and just two years ago, it passed through our solar system. An open question is where it came from. We cannot yet, with the information we have in hand, say if it came from a star that was nearby or one that was on the other side of the galaxy by now. So, time for a break. You may have noticed I like to talk, and I certainly like to talk about these things, so um, don't get me started. Okay, so to summarize what we know about this object, um, it was clearly an interstellar origin. It came from somewhere else in the galaxy. It did not come from the solar system. It is relatively small, 
size of this building. It's elongated in some fashion to explain the change in brightness that we see as it rotates. Um, analysis indicates that this object tumbles rather than simply spins the way Earth does on its axis. It must be relatively bright to explain the infrared Spitzer observations or the lack of observation. Um, other uh, observations from telescopes that see visible light, the, uh, the light that our eyes can see, also indicates that it's red in color. And uh, perhaps most intriguingly, it accelerated as it moved away from the solar system by just a little bit, but that was a very strong detection. So we know that it actually did this. At this point in 2019, two years after it was discovered, um, Oumuamua is now out at about the distance of Saturn. It is far from the sun, that makes it faint, that makes it impossible to detect with any of the telescopes that we have today. So our, our period of collecting data about this object that we can analyze, that we can scrutinize is over. We've learned what we could learn from actual measurements, and now it's simply a matter of arguing and analyzing the details. But we're still left with questions. What is this thing? Where did it come from? How old is it? How large is it? Is it the size of the building? The size of this room? The smaller the object is, the shinier it would have to be to reflect the amount of light that we saw from it. But a large object can have a small amount of mass. A large object can also have a large amount of mass. A large chunk of rock is going to have a large amount of mass. Um, a piece of aluminum foil the size of a tennis court is going to have a small amount of mass. And that's a, a piece of information that we cannot measure for this object. We don't know how much mass it had. What shape is it really? Is it the shape of a, of a rock? Uh, in the shape of a hot dog? Is it flat? We don't know. Where did it come from? Why did it pass so close to the sun? And how did it accelerate if it isn't venting gas the way a comet does? So a year after the discovery, in uh, fall of 2018, last year, two astronomers, uh, Shmiel Bialy and Abraham Loeb of Harvard published a provocative paper um, suggesting other explanations for why Oumuamua accelerated as it left the vicinity of the sun. And they describe the possibility, and they're careful to say that this is a possibility, not a certain explanation, but the possibility that this object was a thin, lightweight structure. Whether that structure was naturally formed or artificial, um, they hedged their bets because the information is incomplete. So in this paper from last year, they propose that the brightness in, uh, variations could be explained by a thin sheet rather than a hot dog shape that was tumbling. And so when it's seen face on, we see a lot of sunlight reflect from it. When it's seen edge on, we see very little. Um, the acceleration that was observed could be explained by simply sunlight pressure pushing on this thin sheet of material. And they actually calculated um, conditions to that would have to be true if this object were pushed by sunlight pressure. It would have to be thin. This is even thinner than paper thin, sort of aluminum foil or mylar thin. And it would have to be lightweight, a little bit uh, like the mass, uh, the weight of a, say, motorcycle. Uh, they calculated that passing through interstellar space, this object would survive for vast stretches of time being impacted by gas and dust in the interstellar environment. 
And they also calculated that even though it's this large, thin thing, kind of like a parachute, um, it would not actually stop under the influence of, being, of running into gas and dust out there in interstellar space. So they didn't conclude that it is an artificial structure, but they said that what we know about it is consistent with an artificial structure like a light sail. And it's interesting that they chose this because right now there is a light sail in orbit around Earth that was put there by the Planetary Society. Light sail 2 was launched this summer. It is a relatively small light sail it is a demonstration project. It is not intended to go anywhere, but it's intended to prove the idea that you can move a spacecraft around with just sunlight, no rocket fuel necessary. So the sail that you can see here in this photograph, this is actually taken by the little tiny camera on the side of the satellite. You can see the uh, mylar panels that unfolded, a bit like an umbrella, um, out to a size of six meters by six meters. That would easily fit here in the center section of seats. Uh, the entire satellite is about five kilograms. It is a CubeSat, which is a new uh, simple form of satellite that universities and other small organizations are building and utilizing. So it's 30 centimeters tall by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So it's about the size of a loaf of bread. It has solar panels for power to control the computer, to run the computer, and to run the camera and the other instruments. Um, but it gets its propulsion from sunlight. Now, based on the measurements of a muamua, it's estimated that the object was about 100 meters across at maximum. So about the size of a football field or a soccer, uh, soccer field. So, in case you're not familiar with the idea of a light sail, light is said to be composed of particles called photons. Same idea as photon torpedoes in Star Trek. It's the same word. Um, we can measure photons and the behavior of light that acts like particles in a lab. This is a very well understood behavior of light. You can think of the photons as tiny little tennis balls or bullets or pick your favorite small, fast-moving object. As they strike a large, thin surface, they bounce off of it. They reflect, just as light reflects off of a shiny surface. And the momentum, the motion of the photons is then transferred to the shiny material, the sail. And the sail recoils by moving away in the direction of the sunlight. And so in this way, we could launch, in principle, a large solar sail um, into Earth orbit. And using just the pressure of sunlight, that sail could climb out of Earth orbit and then uh, ultimately out of the solar system entirely. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility that we, uh, we ourselves, human civilization, could launch a light sail to the stars um, in the not-too-distant future. Now, the McKelly team that, ch that uh, tracked the motion of Oumuamua and discovered this observed acceleration noticed that, it, that the size or the strength of the acceleration decreased with distance. It decreased uh, with distance in a particular smooth mathematical way and Bialy and Loeb noted in their paper that this is exactly the behavior you would expect for something being pushed by sunlight because as the object got farther away, sunlight would be fainter, would be weaker, and so the amount of acceleration would fall off with distance. They also noted that for the amount of acceleration that was observed, a muamua would have to be very lightweight 
because the amount of pressure produced by sunlight is so small. So if you have a lightweight object, it would be easier to push on it. Think of a piece of Kleenex versus a piece of canvas or a, a, pl a steel plate. So if it was lightweight enough, it could actually be pushed in the way that was observed by the influence of sunlight. And they also noted, noted that there's nothing inconsistent with a muamua being, say, round and thin, or square and thin, versus being uh, hot dog shaped in terms of describing or, or being consistent with the variations in brightness that were detected by telescopes here on Earth. So, this object presumably traveled through interstellar space. It would be um, struck by gas atoms and dust particles all along the way, again, perhaps for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And so, for this to be a plausible explanation for Oumuamua, the object would have to survive for that vast stretch of time. And so, they went through some calculations and showed that for what we know of interstellar gas and dust and the rate at which it would impact a small object like this, light sail, the object could survive a distance of at least 15,000 light years, which is about one-fifth of the way around the galaxy. So it's not a great distance. The a light sail couldn't traverse the entire galaxy, but it could travel from, say, a location near the center of our Milky Way to the location of the Sun and survive that trip. They also noted that... And it moves away from the Sun, great, but it gets close to another star and stops. Why would it be close? <clears throat> So the question was, as it moves away from the sun, it would get closer to other stars. How would it get anywhere if that pressure from other stars would then slow it down? The big difference is that the distance between the stars is so great. And so you're right that it would slow down, it would receive light pressure from other stars, but being so far from those other stars, it would not slow down um, in any measurable way until it got close to those other stars. So if it was far from any pair of stars, it, it would essentially just be drifting. So it, it could go through another star? Yes, yeah, the motions would be, would be great enough that uh, the, as it left one star, it would be um, it would be coasting along until it got close to the vicinity of the other star. And remember that even for our star, the sunlight pressure only amounted to one one thousandth of the amount of the gravitational force exerted by the, by our sun. So for this object, it may have been launched as a light sail, but after that, the effect of light pressure would be, would be minuscule. It wouldn't be driving, um, it wouldn't be um, important in the motion of the, of the object after it was launched with this idea that it's an artificial object, a manufactured object. One of the other mysterious things about this object is that it passed so close to the sun when the solar system is so large. If it passed through the solar system, it could have passed between Mars and Jupiter. It could have passed between Jupiter and Saturn. It could have passed between the Earth and, and Mars. It had plenty of places it could have passed, and yet it passed inside the orbit of Mercury. So, in other writing, Abraham Loeb of Harvard has also pointed out that if a muamua just happened to pass by the sun at this close distance randomly, just by random chance, that would 
imply that there is an enormous collection of these objects out there in interstellar space. Now, of course, we only saw Oumuamua because it passed so close to the sun. So there's also the question of observational bias. We wouldn't have seen this object if it had passed near Pluto. It's too small. It would not reflect much sunlight. It would have gone completely unnoticed. So imagine the solar system as a bullseye and we have a very large number of interstellar objects passing through the solar system. A muamua is the arrow that hits the bullseye. A rough calculation indicates that a muamua had a one in 1,000 chance of passing that close to the sun if it was just arriving randomly, just by chance. So if we ignore a muamua and think about all of the other objects that would have been randomly passing through the solar system, we get that, and this is work by Dave Jewett at University of Hawaii, um, his team calculated that there must be 10,000, give or take, interstellar objects passing through the solar system inside the orbit of Neptune which indicates that there's an enormous number of these bodies out there in interstellar space. These objects have gone unnoticed because only now our technology, uh, our telescope technology has improved to the point that we can see these small objects moving through our solar system. But this large number directly contradicts what we think we understand about the formation of planets. I talked earlier about how these interstellar objects, if they're natural objects like comets and asteroids, they are ejected by the process of planet formation and those objects then go wandering through the galaxy. This number of objects predict, um, calculated by Dave Jewett is a hundred to a billion times larger than the number of interstellar objects we would expect from the process of planet formation. That's a pretty large factor. And so in their paper, Bialy and Loeb last year proposed an alternate hypothesis for the close approach of Oumuamua to the sun. It flew that close intentionally. It was targeted to our solar system. That's a pretty provocative statement, but it also eliminates this problem that we have that, um, that the large number of objects that are necessary to explain randomly how Oumuamua got so close to the sun. So in a very brief section, they describe that if we consider this object as an artificial light sail, it solves a lot of the questions that we have about this first interstellar visitor. So if it was a light sail, perhaps it was directed to this star, or perhaps it directed itself after whatever parent civilization launched it. This would eliminate the need for that vast reservoir of other objects out there in the galaxy to explain how Oumuamua got so close to the sun randomly. This was the very first object that we saw coming from interstellar space. But one of the best things about this idea is that it's testable. It is a scientific idea. We can go out and look how many interstellar objects are passing through the solar system. So we have two possibilities. Future uh, telescope surveys detect a large number, perhaps as many as 10,000 interstellar bodies passing through the solar system. And Oumuamua just happened to be the funny, statistically weird end of that distribution. On our very first try, we just happened to catch the one that passed so close to the sun. But if these telescope surveys are carried out and we don't see a large population of interstellar bodies, 
bodies that are clearly coming in from interstellar space and then leaving again. It's not quite so clear cut, but it provides the possibility that Oumuamua was actually targeted at our sun. It's still within the realm of possibility, although unlikely, that it is just a statistical fluke that it came that close. There's always that chance that you just blindly throw the, the dart at the dartboard and it strikes the bullseye. It's a small chance, but it's still there. But if we detect few of these interstellar bodies in the future, it may also mean that we don't understand this process of planet formation. Now, we can make this story a bit shorter by saying the hardware that we need, the telescopes that we need to do these surveys is actually already being constructed. One such telescope is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It's under construction right now and its science operations are planned to begin in 2022 or 2023. The telescope will house a 8.4 meter diameter mirror so my pace is about one meter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a half. So a mirror that big to collect light. That is 22 times the collecting area of the PanSTARRS telescope. So it will be able to see 22 times deeper. It will be able to see 22 times as many potentially as many objects. The, the synoptic of the telescope's name comes from the idea of covering the night sky repeatedly, continuously. So this telescope is designed to take a single picture that will cover 40 full moons on the sky. And over the course of a night, it will cover one third of the sky overhead from essentially astronomical dark to astronomical sunrise, twilight. The building, here is a recent picture of the building under construction. It's uh, being constructed on Cerro Pachon. Uh, it's about a 7,000 foot peak in central Chile. Uh, it's near some of the other major observatories down there in Chile. Um, if you're not aware, Chile is rapidly becoming the place to build astronomical observatories. It has fantastic weather, uh, it has a fantastic road system and electrical grid. The Chilean government is welcoming the international investments by uh, astronomical um, research organizations and so Chile is, is really um, the place to put these new, this next generation of telescopes. Here you can see the telescope structure itself. The mirror will go in the back. Assembly isn't finished yet. Um, the telescope structure is being, uh, was given to a company in Spain, but the mirrors for this telescope are being uh, fabricated uh, just down the way in Tucson at the University of Arizona Mirror Lab. So in some sense, uh, this is also going to be an Arizona telescope. So the LSST, as its uh, abbreviation is uh, used, um, it has several science goals, like the PanSTARRS telescope. It will be a, a major factory for churning out discoveries of solar system objects. Asteroids right here in the solar system, comets right here in the solar system, but also if they're out there to find interstellar bodies passing through the solar system. It will survey everything in the night sky, so new categories of stars, supernovas exploding in other galaxies, and of course, building a new telescope, you're also going to catch things that you just never imagined were out there. So it will also be just fundamental discovery in the astronomical sciences. I'd like to close with some news. Uh, 
Oumuamua passed by the sun two years ago. We actually have a new interstellar object coming into the solar system right now. It was discovered just a few weeks ago. It was discovered by an astronomer, Gennady Borisov, in Crimea uh, on August 30th, so just a few weeks ago. Um, it's now designated C2019 Q4. And it has an eccentricity, that number that I described earlier, of 3.4. This is the new record. Oumuamua had an eccentricity of 1.2, and everything in the solar system has an eccentricity of less than 1. So this is really coming in at a scream. Um, it's falling fast and will be deflected by the sun uh, by a small amount. The major difference between Oumuamua and what's now being called Comet Borisov is that it appears like a comet. It has a cloud of gas around it. And so, fundamentally, this appears to be a different kind of object than Oumuamua. This is an object, if this is a natural object, it is outgassing, it is venting uh, material into space, as we would expect as it gets close to the sun. Right now, it's beyond the orbit of Mars, so that's still pretty close, uh, warm enough, receiving enough sunlight to, um, to uh, vent a variety of gases, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. So, to get a clear view of the, of the object, the, the telescope tracks the object on the sky, but the object is moving relative to the distant background stars. So, these funny, they almost look like uh, uh, serial codes on, a, on a, the back of a book, um, these are actually images of stars. So, the telescope has taken a picture, moved, to keep track of the object, taking another picture, but by moving, the stars now appear in a different location. So these are trails of three different stars here. I think there's another one up here that's just faintly visible. So those are just background stars. And by tracking the object, the image of the object itself is not blurred. So this object does have features that we would expect from a comet. Um, it's coming from the direction of Cassiopeia, so a completely different piece of the sky. So the exciting thing is we caught this object on the way in. It's currently inbound. It's at the distance of Mars, um, and it's still heading inward. It will reach its closest approach to the sun uh, in December. The data is currently uncertain because we only have three weeks of data, but somewhere the second week of December, this object will pass closest to the sun. And again, it's too soon to say any of the other uh, things that we noticed about Oumuamua. We only have three weeks of data. We don't know if it's accelerating um, in non-gravitational ways. So, we don't know yet, but there's time to learn. So, one eye, a muamua, was observed for only a few weeks in 2017. Gathered a large amount of data, uh, made some inferences about its physical nature, but that few weeks of observations have really not been enough to really answer a lot of questions. Many times in science, and certainly in astronomy, this is the way things work. We get a glimpse of something, and it takes decades, or in some cases, even centuries, to figure out exactly the nature of the universe. I've talked about these two alternate hypotheses. It's a natural object, an asteroid or a comet or something like that, that was sighted by chance as it passed through the inner solar system. The alternate is that this was actually an artificial vehicle, a probe or an artifact, perhaps a piece of a vehicle, that was sent to the solar system or at least was sent into interstellar space and was intercepted by our moving sun and planets. 
So just to summarize here, I, I constructed this table uh, to give you an idea of whether we would expect this kind of behavior. We've seen it before. Uh, I label those in, or highlight those in green, or this is out of the realm of our previous experience. Uh, I label those in red. So we've certainly seen asteroids and comets before. We've certainly seen light sails before. We've, we've built them. Uh, if this is a natural object, we see no examples of an object so elongated as the brightness variations seem to indicate for Oumuamua. Although a light sail, we would expect to be thin and flat. Its outbound acceleration could be described, could be explained by gas venting, but none was observed at the sensitivity that was achieved with the observations that were made in the time the object was observable. However, sunlight pressure is entirely consistent with its motion, and it's what would be expected for a thin, flat sheet of material. For a natural hypothesis, for the asteroids or comets, uh, we would expect interstellar objects from the formation of planets around other stars, and those bodies would be flung out of their parent solar systems by gravitational slingshots. It's less clear in the case of an artificial system. We have no idea of the origin of this body. Um, it could be that sunlight was used and the solar sail uh, climbed away from its star over centuries, or um, as is envisioned for our own designs, perhaps it was launched by laser. Firing a large amount of laser light at the sail would push it up to very high speeds to allow it to climb out of its uh, solar system. We don't know where it came from. We, we cannot identify yet uh, with the data that we have in hand any particular star that we can point to and say, yes, that star was there when Oumuamua was. And that's also true for the artificial case. In terms of an origin, we can explain that, again, by the process of planet formation. We see evidence of planets forming, and we see the evidence of planets themselves in orbit around many thousands of stars. Um, I'll just make a little point on Michio Kaku's statement um, in the, the Fox interview. Most of the stars that you see in the night sky do not have planets because of the process of planet formation. The stars like our own are typically not the ones that you see in the night sky. It's just a quibble, but I figured I'd point it out as an astronomer. The last piece is really the big lift in this question. We have no evidence of other alien civilizations yet. And so, if we're going to propose, if we're going to take this idea seriously that this is an artificial structure, whether it was intended as a light sail or it just acted as one as it fell through our solar system, we have to have additional, pretty substantial evidence that there is um, a source for this piece of hardware. Now, even if Oumuamua is not of alien manufacture, it's still a foreign object to our solar system. It came from somewhere else. So it is telling us about other places and other times in our galaxy. And we shouldn't expect that we should just have the answer from just a few weeks of observations. Now, it's always fun to think about alien artifacts. Um, they're the stuff of science fiction um, and, and other pursuits. Um, but we still need to rely on the old idea that extraordinary claims that this is an alien artifact, that claim requires extraordinary evidence. And perhaps the claim of an alien civilization is the biggest, most extraordinary, extraordinary claim you can make in science. 
But we do know that asteroids and comets exist, and we expect that they are thrown into interstellar space as planetary systems form. So the most likely explanation for Oumuamua is that it's a natural object, that it was thrown out of its home, its parent planetary system. It does have some unusual properties, but we don't know everything about the universe. Maybe planetary bodies form in different ways in other solar systems, around other stars. And again, the information is certainly incomplete in this case. Now, personally, to end on a personal note, I think it was a little um, overzealous for other astronomers to come out immediately and say, no, it is not possible at all, which was the common answer, that this object was artificial. Um, and I say that because of our own experience as a human civilization. We ourselves have already launched things to the stars. The Pioneer spacecraft are on their way out of the solar system. The Voyager spacecraft, launched a few years later, are also out on their way out of the solar system. And so we know from direct experience that it is possible to launch artificial objects to the stars. And so for astronomers to shut that even possibility, that discussion down, um, I think was, was a, um, wasn't necessary. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So that's what I had. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Are there any telescopes currently being built that will have another opportunity to take a look at P2010A2, that um, 354 linear, I think they call it? Um, typically, telescopes are only constructed here on Earth. So if the, if the comet or other body is far away, we just have to wait till it comes back. Um, so again, in, in general, in astronomy, we're, we're left to the whims of the universe. Um, Do you think there's anything strange or... Uh, potentially artificial about that object? I don't know enough about that object to, to say one way or another. I've got a quick question. Uh, based on the trajectory of it coming into our sun's orbit, slingshotting around, what star is it projected to, is it pointed at any particular star going away from our sun? my thinking would, is it just ping-ponging through the galaxy star to star? Um, I don't, I hadn't seen any analyses on that. Again, that would be a relatively uh, complex analysis because the stars that are in that direction now won't be there by the time it arrives. So we would need to go back to, um, let's see, where did I put that? we would need to go back to a data set that actually tracked the motions and the distances of the stars so that we could determine which ones are going to cross the path of Oumuamua. So my, my expectation is, and, and certainly, you know, the fact that even with the 7 million stars that we already had tracked, none of them came closer than a light year. Now, to put that in perspective, I talked about the, the Earth-Sun distance as one astronomical unit. A light year on that scale is 63,000 times bigger. Pluto, our, our most familiar nearby planet, or distant planet, is 40 astronomical units from the Sun. So a light year is still more than a thousand times further away than Pluto is from the sun. So these, these were the closest matches that the team found, but they're still not really close in terms of if this object were to come from the, the realm of the planets around that star, it was quite a big mismatch. Um, my 
my understanding is that mirrors for telescopes are really delicate creatures. How are they going to, are they, are they going to build the, the mirror down there? Are they yep. building it here and transporting it? How are they going to do that? They, yeah, the mirrors, the, this optical design for, for the LSST actually uses three mirrors, one mirror that is 8.4 meters across, a smaller mirror which will fit up here, and then a third mirror that will also direct the light down into the instruments. Um, you're right, mirror, you know, glass, mirrors are made of glass, glass tends to be fragile. The short answer is that they're gonna transport it very, very carefully. <laughs> um, beyond that, it's just a matter of, you know, doing your homework, making sure that it arrives in one piece. Um, the, the mirror lab at Tucson already has a track record of doing this. They manufactured the two mirrors for the large binocular telescope here in Arizona, and those mirrors are now stationed at Mount Graham uh, in southeastern Arizona. Um, there's also another telescope called the Giant Magellan Telescope that will actually use six 8.4 meter mirrors uh, in, in a hexagonal arrangement. Um, that telescope is a project of the European Southern Observatory. Um, so they will have their work cut out for them. I am not an engineer by training, and I don't know how a lot of these things are done, um, but you know, it's always amazing when the engineers can pull it off and, and build these telescopes and, and create these machines for studying the universe. How close did Oumuamua get to the Earth as far as where it was in its orbit as it came through, I guess, close to Mercury? Uh, I believe that the closest that Oumuamua came to Earth was approximately one astronomical unit. How was that? So it wasn't a particularly close approach to Earth. Is there any possibility that object could be intergalactic between galaxies, or is it could be, right? It's just um, somewhere. <laughs> we don't know. The, I mean, I can imagine some uh, one way to answer that is, is there enough time in the history of the universe for as this object is moving across the distance between galaxies, can it do it in that? 14 billion year time span. Um, quick and dirty calculation, my guess is no. But. Uh, Dr. Healy, thank yeah. you very much for the excellent presentation, by the way. And uh, I'm, I realize I'm asking you to speculate, but I'm really curious why you think that uh, Doctors uh, Bialy and Loeb kind of went there on the whole artificial explanation and, and why now and it's just not typically what scientists would do. That, that's a great point. Uh, Abraham Loeb actually has a history of bringing out provocative ideas to start discussions. Sometimes he's not entirely serious, but he knows the discussion will be useful. Um, I, I can't speak to what his mindset was in this case, but certainly as you've seen, this isn't completely wild-ass guess. You know, it does fit the observations. Now, again, it's based on this very large uncertainty and, you know, are we alone in the universe? Is there evidence of alien civilizations that we could collect in the next, you know, number of years? Um, but starting that, taking on those thoughts and taking them seriously, I think is important. And more generally, it feeds into what other scientists are taking seriously right now, which is the growing field of astrobiology. There might certainly be extraterrestrial life right here in our own solar system, under the surface of Mars, under the ice of the moon Europa, um, uh, Enceladus at Saturn. There's plenty of places that we can imagine there might be life here in our own solar system. 
and the conditions for, for life as we know it um, out there on planets orbiting other stars, you know, the numbers j just tell the story. A hundred billion stars in our galaxy, if you're really conservative and you say there's an Earth-like planet only around every one billion of those stars, that's still a hundred Earth-like planets just in our galaxy. Now, if they're on the other side of the galaxy, we're not going to have a conversation with them, but powerful enough telescopes might reveal their presence just as we're shouting at the universe with our television and radio broadcasts, our radio waves that are going out into the universe, anybody with our technology within 50 to 60 light years of us would certainly know we are here. And Stephen Hawking has made a, he made a point of that a few years ago that maybe we should just shut the hell up. <laughs> you know, if we don't really know who's out there, should we be calling attention to ourselves? And it raises these important questions which affect us all. You know, if the giant moon-sized UFO arrives over New York and they demand, you know, all of our left socks as tribute or, you know, whatever it is, that's going to affect us all, not just the scientists, not just all of you in an organization here. That's a human concern. And I think many times we're too short-sighted on the astronomy side to just focus on the, the non-biological kinds of things that we can talk about. Um, but also more broadly in society, that you are seen as a fringe group where you are exploring questions that can potentially remake human history. Um, so I, th I think there's room to grow, you know, everywhere. We, we can all certainly improve. <laughs> okay, yes. I, I have another question about the, the light sail. I mean, that's a really interesting theory. Um, it sort of explains the tumbling that you were talking about before. But there's something I can't wrap my head around, and that is, and maybe it's because we're human, we think of a sail in a certain way, like the sail on a sailboat. But how could something like that possibly move at 80-something kilometers per second? You know what I mean? Is there any, any Well, I mean, imagine, imagine you get out here on the 202 on a bike, and you don't have to worry about air resistance or friction because you're going through space, um, and you just start pedaling. And you start pedaling and you keep pedaling, and you keep pedaling, you go faster, and faster, and faster, and faster. Eventually, you're going to get up to whatever speed you want, as long as there's abundant sunlight available. And so one thought is that you could get a light sail up to a very great speed by actually dropping it towards the sun on an elliptical orbit that would carry it close to the sun, and then you unfurl the sail. And now it's in a very bright environment with all that sun, all that light pouring out of the sun, and now it moves away at a substantially higher speed than it would if, it, if you unfurled the sail at this distance from the sun. So there are, there are thoughts of you know, how you could, you could utilize the sun. The alternative is you just do it artificially. And Project um, Starshot um, is envisioning the idea of building a launch facility that would be many hundreds of megawatt lasers. And they would be fired into space. And those light sails would then be pushed by that in enormous intensity of light up to the plans call for about 10% of the speed of light. And at that speed, we can get a probe. Well, I don't have my cell phone with me, but you know, probe that size. Cell phone has a pretty good camera on it. Um, if you do the numbers, you can actually pick up the radio signal from a cell phone from a distance of several light years with the radio telescopes we have right now. 
And so you throw a little payload, not a big spacecraft like we send to the planets, but a little one, one that you can throw at a substantial fraction of the speed of light, and it gets to nearby stars in a matter of a few decades. So still a long time, but the, the junior scientists and engineers on that project that begin the project would retire seeing their, the fruits of their labor at the end of their lifespan. You know, that first picture that comes back of a planet orbiting another star. Not just a point of light as we see Oumuamua, but a world as we see Earth. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, they, um, there's, there's three 30-meter uh, telescopes being built right now. Are they expecting uh, them to, expecting to find quite a few planets, and when there was these telescopes are in in operation within a, within the next five ten years? Yeah, we're we're at, sort of at the beginning of a new uh, of a next revolution in observational astronomy with the the um, the construction and operation of these these new big telescopes. Um, the the LSST has a primary mirror that's eight and a half meters across. Um, some of the telescopes that are being planned and under construction have mirrors that are 30 meters across. So they wouldn't even fit in this room. The collecting area of those telescopes will allow us to do things like image individual planets orbiting other stars. Not in this amount of detail, but perhaps a couple of pixels. Enough information to tell us what color it is. Maybe measure its spectrum and tell us what chemical uh, species are in its atmosphere. Is there free oxygen? Is there water? Um, and those kinds of instruments will then allow us to answer questions that we have today. So yeah, it's, it's very exciting, you know, uh, compared to what we had even with Hubble um, these telescopes will be, will be the next revolution. Wouldn't a light sail uh, have burned up if it went inside the orbit of, between Mercury and the Sun? No, um, certainly it would get hot, but even materials that we know uh, would survive that, that much sunlight. Um, in fact, we have a probe, the Parker Solar Probe right now, that is expected to get, I believe it's 10 times closer than Oumuamua got to the sun. Now, it has a special heat shield because it has delicate instruments. You know, it's not just a sail, yeah, but it's... Is the temperature on, Mer on the surface of Mercury uh, like four or 500 degrees? Yes, yeah. Uh, so I think plastic would, would be gone. Yeah, plastic would be gone, but metal foil, um, ceramics, you know, you can, it's, it's not completely infeasible that you could build it out of something that would survive. Is it possible that there could be a natural uh, solar sail, essentially? I mean, is that one possibility? That is a possibility that they bring up in the, the Bialy and Loeb paper. They say, well, it doesn't have to be artificial. It could be just something that we've never seen before that is thin and flat. And, you know, it would be rare, but you could imagine something thin and flat occurring even in Earth's environment. Um, slate, mica, right. forms naturally thin and flat. Now, how you get that into space is another question, mm -hmm. but certainly thin, flat things do occur naturally. Um, Perhaps they could grow out of a cloud of gas as the gas cools, then you know, like salt crystals forming out of a salt solution. Maybe a gas could form as it condensed. It could form a thin, flat sheet of material. Um, so yeah, they, they, they make that point in the paper. This doesn't have to be an artificial object, it, but it could be. Are they able to calculate because that phenomena, the solar pressure phenomena, causes the acceleration as it leaves, were they able to calculate the same phenomena occurring, slowing it down as it came in? 
No, because we don't have any measurements of its, of its trajectory on the way in. So all, all, we can pro, all we can suppose, we can assume, is that the motion on the way out was equivalent to the motion on the way in. Okay, and lastly, is there any other natural hypothesis out there uh, to account for the acceleration other than the solar pressure? Uh, not that I've seen. It was, you know, the, the, the one that everyone jumped at was, you know, this is, this is venting as a comet does. Um, you know, if we're going to get wild, you know, maybe it was some kind of new thruster, uh, you know, and this is actually a, an actual scout um, by somebody interested in exploring our solar system. Um, you, know, you can imagine all kinds of possibilities, um, but the the, the go-to explanation was was uh, outgassing, was venting of gas. The problem is it doesn't seem to fit what we observe, um, so it's an open mystery. All right, thank you. You're welcome, Dr. Healy. Fascinating, informative, thought, very thought-provoking talk. I am wondering if you know of any astronomers who believe that we have been visited, we are being visited by ET alien intelligence. Uh, there, are, there is evidence in paintings that go back to the Renaissance of objects in the sky that look like UFOs or flying saucers. More contemporary, there's uh, uh, video taken, still pictures taken, first-hand encounter reports. So are there any astronomers that you know that accept that we are, we're not alone and that we're being visited by ET alien intelligence? I don't know of any astronomers personally but I do know of some astronomers that uh, take seriously the measurements and eyewitness reports uh, that, that we're not alone he even here on Earth. Um, as I was talking to a couple people during break, I think the weight of the evidence is, is still light compared to what we know in terms of physics and chemistry and biology of life here on Earth, of, of astronomical observations. Um, but I think that is changing. As I mentioned, the, the growing field of astrobiology is, is still seen as somewhat fringe in the sciences, but I think it is raising the awareness in the scientific community that these are questions that can actually be asked and answered in a scientific way, using the scientific method. Um, I know from experience that the default reaction to um, eyewitness reports and photography and videography is that there's always a natural explanation for it. Um, and it really comes down to, we just don't have the evidence. So I'll, I'll echo Michio Kaku's statement in the interview, steal something if you get abducted. <laughs> it would be very easy to demonstrate that there's alien technology on Earth, or you were exposed to it, if you could just bring it to a lab. It could be made out of an element we've never seen before. It could be assembled in a way that we thought impossible. It could do things that we thought impossible. Um, and yet, to the broader scientific community, those kinds of examples, that kind of evidence, hasn't turned up yet. So, um, you know, we're, we're stuck drawing conclusions from the data that we have. My question is about the Hubble telescope. When they made that and set it up there, they had that big goof. How did that come about, and did they really fix it right? First answer is it was a human error. Second answer was 
Yes, it was human ingenuity. So the Hubble, when it was launched, uh, the primary mirror, the main mirror that collects the light for the telescope, for the instruments, was manufactured to the wrong shape. So just as eyeglasses have to be the right shape so that they focus the light properly, a telescope mirror has to be the right shape to focus the light into the instruments properly. And they discovered after the investigation, after the telescope was already in orbit and they'd opened the cover and they'd started taking pictures, they immediately realized something was horribly wrong. So they went back to the manufacturing facility, Ball Aerospace manufactured the mirror, and they realized that the instrument that they were using to measure the shape of the mirror was itself manufactured incorrectly. So it was as if they were using foot rulers that were 11 inches long to measure the dimensions of the mirror. And so it was a very, very, very small mistake. The, the difference in the calibration instrument, its real distance, its real length compared to its correct length was just a few millimeters. But it was enough to throw off the entire calibration. But knowing that, they knew exactly how to fix the optics. So in 1993, after a crash program of developing new cameras, the space shuttle delivered the new cameras. The old cameras were taken out. The new cameras were inserted. The telescope was, was uh, put back into orbit, and the space shuttle came home. They turned on everything, and everything worked beautifully. It's not as good as it would have been if the telescope had been manufactured correctly the first time. But they recover about 80% of the light that was originally out of focus as it bounces off of the main mirror. So the hope is that the next generation of space telescopes that's being assembled and, and designed now, they will check and double check and triple check and quadruple check and quintuple check their processes many different ways to eliminate that problem. We have time for one last question. The Bialian lobe uh, theory or hypothesis that it was a maximum thickness up to 0.9 millimeters. I mean, that's less than 40 thousandths of an inch. Yeah. So you're talking about a hollow object. A hollow or just a thin right. sheet, yes. So, but a sheet, if it's tumbling and rotating, um, it would suggest a form, a three-dimensional form, not just a sheet. Or some kind of internal stiffening yeah. rods, yeah. 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 They don't go into a lot of, you know, they're try not trying to reverse engineer the right. design. They, they're I mean, just going I mean, off Particularly of the, because the, the maximum brightness of the object was when it was in its oblong mm -hmm. position. So if it was a sheet, theoretically, that sheet could be seen edge on at least at some point. So that would suggest a three-dimensional form. Yes. Yeah. In the in the paper, they talk about you know a, a perfectly flat sheet isn't the only possibility. It could be curved like the skin of an umbrella. Yeah. Um, it could be a cone. Um, but for the the intensity of sunlight to push it in such a way that it it accelerates in the way that it was observed, it would have to have a large area to a small amount of mass. But if it was a curvature, a, a parabolic form, because I'm familiar with how that's used yeah. in commercial mm -hmm. lighting for reflectors, yeah. mm -hmm. that would focus that light in a tight beam. And if it was on the opposite side, the convex side, that would diffuse the light in a whole different way. Yeah. So were there any calculations made based on that? Because that would be, I think, of paramount. I mean, that, that would tell you if it was a curvature uh, or flat or if it actually had a three-dimensional form. Yeah. Uh, putting this talk together, I thought of those issues too. But I think at least we can address it a little bit by considering the fact that that if it were tumbling, the chance of it 
ending up exactly edge on to the Earth so that we see a set effectively zero reflected light would be small. Right. And we only had a brief few week period, right, right, right. which is, well, if it's eight hours of right. rotation, that's three times in a day. You only have a few weeks of observation. So, you know, you're only talking maybe True. 20, to maybe 50, maybe 100 total rotations. Um, so, yeah, with the limited data, you know, we can go off in many different directions. But, yeah, those, were, those would be things that we would have to consider. Yeah, well, thank you.